Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Hollywood scandals are one of the most sordid events ever to shock the movie land community. Filled with myths, questions and rumour, these stories present Tinseltown at its darkest. The Francho Tone, Barbara Payton, Tom Neal affair, a torrid and violent triangle that exploded in the early 1950s and kept giving the tabloid press spicy items for well over a decade. Why Francho Tone's love triangle led to the scandal of the year. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Francho Tone correctly predicted the entirety of his career in a 1936 photo play interview. He detailed a plan he would fully follow as years passed. I'd like to stay with acting for the rest of my life. When I'm middle-aged, well, then I'll take middle-aged parts. And when I'm old, I can always be a character actor. I wouldn't give up pictures. The stage is better, offers more opportunity for sustained moods and continued work. But it would be swell to come out to Hollywood for a part of every year and then go back to the footlights. If remembered at all, the name Franco Tone usually comes up only when someone lists Joan Crawford's series of husbands. Never mind the fact that Franco Tone appeared in about 60 films, countless plays and dozens of television shows. Franco's career as an actor may not have survived the test of time, though classic film lovers will remember his ensign biome from 1935's Mutiny on the Bounty. But he scores the top spot on the list for having the honour of catching the eye of both Crawford and Davis. He might be the spark that kicked off the long-standing rivalry between Davis and Crawford. I fell in love with Francho professionally and privately, Davis wrote later in life of her 1935 Dangerous co-star. Everything about him reflected his elegance, from his name to his manners. But Betty didn't land tone, Joan did. He was madly in love with her, Davis would recall. They met each day for lunch, he would return to the set, his face covered in lipstick. I was jealous, of course. Francho Tone became Joan's second, or third, husband in 1935. They would divorce four years later. Two years before Davis's death, the actress gave a 1987 interview to British gossip writer Michael Thornton, where, either emboldened to honesty by the passage of time, or not quite in command of her thoughts due to declining health, she allegedly summed up the Crawford Tone affair this way. She took him from me. She did it coldly, deliberately, and with complete ruthlessness. I have never forgiven her for that, and never will. That, more than anything, has become Tone's enduring legacy. He was a fine actor, but he'll long be remembered as the first wedge between two women who, at the end of the day, had much more in common than not. He was born Stanislas Pascal Francho Tone in Niagara Falls, New York, on 27th of February 1905, into a well-off and socially prominent family. His father was Frank J. Tone, an engineer and industrialist and president of the Carborundum Company in Niagara Falls. His mother, Gertrude Francho Tone, was from the well-known Francho family. Tone used her maiden name as his stage name. He found his passion for the stage while attending Cornell University. His career path was to be predetermined by working for his family business, an electrochemical company. Born to an affluent family in upstate New York, he attended private schools and travelled extensively before settling down to a college at Cornell. But it was his joining the drama club that his career made a detour and his passion for the stage began. After graduation, Francho joined a stock company in Buffalo, making only $15 a week during the mid-1920s. He worked hard at his new vocation, playing mainly bit roles and learning every aspect of the theatre. After studying the stage and dedicating himself to his craft, he made his Broadway debut in The Age of Innocence, 1929. He became a member of the Theatre Guild and was cast in several productions for them, including Red Dust, and Hotel Universe in 1930, and the unsuccessful Green Grow the Lilacs in 1931. Also in 1931, Tone joined the Group Theatre in New York, 
which had just been formed by Lee Strasberg and Harold Clerman. It was one of the first schools of method acting, and Tone appeared in leading roles in several of the theatre's early productions, including The House of Connolly, Big Night and Success Story. He was rapidly making a name for himself as a first-class actor. Strasberg hailed him as the best actor in the company, and it was not long before he came to the attention of Hollywood. But it was his performance in Success Story in 1931 that got him noticed by Hollywood producers. He was offered a contract by MGM and moved to Hollywood at the end of 1932. He was still more intent on success in the theatre rather than on screen, but he moved to Hollywood in late 1932 and began the most successful and memorable period of his career. His first screen appearance was in The Wiser Sex, 1932, opposite Claudette Colbert, then in Today We Live, 1933, co-starring MGM star Joan Crawford. She was recently divorced from Douglas Fairbanks Jr., romance blossomed between the two, so MGM took advantage of their on-screen chemistry, pairing them in several films together during the 1930s. Francho was loaned out to Warner Brothers in 1935 to star opposite Betty Davis in Dangerous. Betty fell for her leading man, but was stonewalled. Francho was already engaged to her rival, Joan Crawford. Betty was envious and ashamed of her actions, and sources say this is what caused the venomous rivalry and long-standing feud between the two actresses that lasted the rest of their lives. Joan and Francho were married in 1935, but their chemistry was short-lived. Francho, with his blue blood upbringing, did not mesh well with the uneducated Joan and her simple Oklahoma roots. Although there is no doubt this caused issues at home, rumours swirled that it was Francho's steady career, while Joan's star power and top billing continued, that caused jealousy and resentment. Whenever Francho was mentioned in the press, he was referred to as Mr. Joan Crawford. I'm sure taking second billing to the phenomenon that is Joan Crawford couldn't be easy for anyone. Francho received great reviews for his role in The Lives of Bengal Lancer and playing Ensign Byam in Mutiny on the Bounty in 1935. He was nominated for Best Actor alongside his co-stars Clark Gable and Charles Lawton. Over the next few years, Tone became one of Hollywood's top male stars, appearing in a number of quality movies with the top leading ladies of the day. He had divorced Joan in 1939, but was called back to Hollywood at the end of 1940 by MGM, where he was still under contract. Tone churned out a few more movies during the 1940s, often loaning himself out to other studios to get back at MGM for not letting him out of his contract. He married actress and co-star Jean Wallace in 1941, and they had two sons together. They divorced in 1948. Francho Tone played a leading role in a hundred films and four marriages, but in 1951 a scandal overshadowed Francho's acting and ruined the careers of actors Tom Neal and Barbara Payton. Tom Neal and Francho Tone were both in love with the beautiful blonde actress in the early 1950s, and that love triangle led to the scandal of the year. The lives of these three stars would intertwine in a way that would forever destroy the careers of two of them. Barbara first met Francho at Ciro's in the early months of 1950. Francho was instantly hooked when he judged a Charleston dance contest at the Macambo and saw Barbara for the first time. Barbara Payton was still married to her first husband, John Payton, when she met Francho. Payton referred to Francho as the actor with the most class in Hollywood and recalled, I went out with every big male star in town. They wanted my body, and I needed their name for success. Francho Tone, suave, likeable, quiet. An exciting Francho asked me to do a play with him in New York. He was hooked on me. He believed in me too. That was the route I had to travel. He spelled it out for me, and I read him. Kiss me, and your troubles are over, right? So I went east with Tone. Despite warnings from friends that he may be entering into dangerous territory, 45-year-old Francho fell hard and devoted himself to wooing 23-year-old Barbara. He was drawn to her gutsiness and rough-around-the-edges persona. Francho liked that Barbara wore temporary face tattoos and had pink dye in her hair, 
atypical of 1950s beauty norms. As much as he liked this side of Barbara, Francho felt the need to guide her into his version of the perfect lady. He gifted her with jewellery and expensive furs, and introduced her to the most well-respected people and establishments. Barbara was certainly unfair to Francho in many ways, but it was also unrealistic and unfair of Francho to expect Barbara to eventually change to suit him. Francho was only six years younger than Barbara's father, Lee Flip Redfield, and Barbara seemed to view Francho as a father figure of sorts. She had always desired more love and attention from her father. There's some speculation out there that abuse may have occurred between father and daughter, which created Barbara's need to please men and eagerness for attention. During their courtship, Barbara called Francho Doc, liked to cook for him, and embraced his guidance. In the summer of 1950, Francho travelled with Barbara to the Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye premiere and a key to the city presentation in Miami. A man who usually shielded himself from publicity of any kind, Francho embraced public appearances with his new girlfriend. In September 1950, Francho and Barbara co-starred in a production of The Second Man. She was granted a divorce in September of that year, and Francho announced that they were engaged at a party at the Stork Club in New York City. By this time, Barbara was reputed to have slept with every leading man she had ever been in a film with, and worse. Some of this gossip was not true, but Barbara was a notorious party girl, and Francho's friends and colleagues did not approve of his relationship with Barbara. Even his ex-wife, Joan Crawford, tried to talk Francho out of marrying her. That same month, Barbara garnered negative attention when she was a defence witness in the perjury trial of Stanley Adams, a friend of Barbara's who was suspected of murder. December 1950 marked the second occasion of bad publicity for the couple. Before Francho's custody battle with his ex-wife, Jean Wallace, the write-ups on Francho and Barbara's association were pretty benign. Jean testified that she was concerned about her sons being near Barbara and didn't approve of Barbara's social activities. On the stand, Francho had to publicly state that he'd seen Barbara clothless on many occasions. Not scandalous by today's standards, but it made quite a headline in 1950. Barbara's career and her relationship with Francho seemed to be going smoothly. She had met his friends and family, and he, hers. Barbara's friend and sister-in-law, Jan Zollinger Redfield, said, Francho Tone was a very nice and extremely generous person. We saw him several times at Barbara's apartment, and he was a lovely man. Although I don't think I ever saw him without a drink in his hand. He was never out of line, nor did I ever hear him raise his voice at Barbara, ever. His manners were always impeccable. Lee and Mabel, Barbara's parents, both liked him and were impressed with how cultured he was. I know they were hoping that he would get Barbara to finally settle down and start behaving herself. Francho was a gentle human being, and Frank and I were always very comfortable around him, and he adored Barbara. He showered her with gifts, and she loved it. In July 1951, Francho went on a business trip to New York, and this was when Barbara met actor Tom Neal at a pool party. She was immediately struck by Tom's good looks and muscular physique, and quickly began a torrid affair with him. She was quoted in Exposed magazine as saying, It was love at first sight. I saw him in a swimming pool. He looked so wonderful in his trunks that I knew he was the only man in my life. Several days later, and obviously without Francho's knowledge, Barbara had moved Tom into her apartment, on which Francho paid the rent, and began introducing him as her boyfriend to others. When a concerned friend asked about Francho, Barbara dismissed it with the explanation that she'd deal with Francho later. Barbara publicly called off her engagement to Francho by the end of July. Barbara proposed marriage to Tom, broke her engagement with Francho, then went back and forth between the two actors several times, pitting one against the other. August saw Barbara back with Francho, then abruptly back with Tom. September found the entire screwed-up affair blowing up in everyone's faces and presenting lasting consequences for all involved. The triangle exploded one night in front of Barbara's home when Tom Neal assaulted Francho Tone and beat the living daylights out of him. Tone and Neil encountered each other one evening at Peyton's home, 
and with the actress providing an enthralled audience, the two men attempted to settle the issue with fisticuffs. Tone was beaten soundly, with his opponent inflicting a broken cheekbone, a nose, a concussion, and a no doubt severely bruised ego. Francho was hospitalised and remained comatose for 18 hours. Public sympathy went against Tom because he had been a boxer in his younger days. There was little sympathy for Hollywood's bad blonde either. Their careers were as good as finished as lurid stories of the incident splashed across the country's newspapers. Much to everyone's shock, Francho Tone married Barbara Payton anyway, although the marriage lasted only two months. Tom Neal was named co-respondent in their divorce. Francho used explicit photographs to prove his course of action and then spitefully mailed dozens of pictures of Barbara in compromising positions with Tom to heads of major studios to destroy her chances of ever working in Hollywood again. Peyton vacated the marital home and returned to Neil, and Tone, perhaps wisely, decided to resolve the issue in court rather than in another bout. Peyton and Neil became engaged after Tone won a divorce over the issue of adultery, but the marriage never came off. Neil eventually married a receptionist named Gail Bennett, living with her in Palm Springs until 1965, when she was murdered. Eventually Neil was convicted of manslaughter in her death. And Tone? Francho Tone continued to appear in movies and television until the end of his life. He got married once more to Dolores Dawn in 1956. They divorced four years later. At the time of his death from lung cancer on September 18, 1968, he was making plans to produce and star in a biography of French artist Pierre-Auguste Renoir. Tom Neal made few appearances in films after 1953 and eventually left Hollywood. He married twice. His first wife died from cancer. He was convicted of manslaughter for killing his second wife with a gun that he swore went off accidentally. He served six years of a ten-year sentence and died on August 7, 1972, eight months after his release from Soledad State Prison. He attempted to remarry Joan Crawford when he was dying of cancer in the 1960s, but she demurred, though she did care for him in his last days and arranged his funeral when he died in 1968. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. The 1951 scandal overshadowed Franchot's acting and ruined the careers of actors Tom Neal and Barbara Payton. Obviously, Franchot had a few enemies in Hollywood, not like Jimmy Durante. Do you want to find out why was Jimmy Durante the only man without an enemy in showbiz?